Tonight, the historic verdict in the case of the mother of a school shooter. On count one of involuntary manslaughter, as to Madison Baldwin, we find the defendant guilty of involuntary manslaughter. Jennifer Crumbly found guilty on all counts of involuntary manslaughter in connection to her son's deadly high school shooting in Michigan, killing four classmates using a gun his parents bought him. How missed warning signs factored into the decision and what happens next? And this is the easiest recusal analysis case you could ever imagine. No doubt, no doubt. This is as straightforward as it gets. Conflict of interest? ABC News Live takes a critical look at conservative justice Clarence Thomas's wife, Virginia, her role in a campaign to overturn the results of the 2020 election, and the question many are asking, should Justice Thomas recuse himself in the key cases ahead? Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're following those stories and much more. Including developing news, House Republicans failed to impeach Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas after Mayorkas faced major criticism over immigration policy. We have the latest. Plus, the D.C. Court of Appeals delivers a scathing ruling to Donald Trump, rejecting the former president's claim of immunity from prosecution in the federal election interference case. And... Said goodbye at the cattle guard gate, hoping she would find... After a three-year battle with stomach cancer, we remember country music star Toby Keith, whose songs became country anthems. But we do begin with that landmark verdict in a case involving a parent's responsibility for their child's actions. A Michigan jury has found mother Jennifer Crumbly guilty of involuntary manslaughter and her son's killing of four classmates. She's now the first parent to be convicted for a child's deadly school shooting. Crumbly and her husband James had bought their son the gun as a gift. A juror told ABC News it came down to the fact that Jennifer was the last adult with the gun. She now faces sentencing for four counts of involuntary manslaughter, one for each of the four classmates her son shot dead. We're looking at the precedent this verdict sets and the message for parents everywhere. But first, ABC's Trevor Ault leads us off at the courthouse in Michigan. Tonight in Michigan, that historic verdict. We find the defendant guilty of involuntary manslaughter. Guilty of involuntary manslaughter. Guilty of involuntary manslaughter. Guilty of involuntary manslaughter. Jennifer Crumbly guilty of those four counts of involuntary manslaughter, one for each of the students her son murdered at Oxford High School in 2021. She is the first parent in the U.S. ever held criminally liable for their child's school shooting. The jury, comprised of six men, six women, some parents, some gun owners, deliberating for 11 hours over two days, determining Crumbly failed in her duty as a parent, ignoring the signs of her son's deteriorating mental health and gifting him the gun he used in the shooting. The defense argued it was her husband James's responsibility to secure the weapon, but the jury foreperson saying after the verdict, the thing that really hammered it home is that she was the last adult with the gun. Prosecutor showing this video in court, Crumbly taking her son to the firing range. You're the last adult to have possession of that gun. Correct. The shooter bringing that 9mm handgun to school just three days later. And even that morning, prosecutor said Crumbly had the chance to stop the shooting. Called in for that meeting with her son's counselor, the school concerned about what was written on his math assignment. Crumbly never telling the school to look for a gun. The shooter opening fire hours later. Today, Crumbly sitting motionless, eyes down as the verdict was read, quickly escorted away in handcuffs. The judge thanking the jury. We all know that this is one of the hardest things you've ever done. Prosecutors shaking hands and hugging the families of the victims. And tonight, Craig Schilling, whose son Justin was killed with this message to Jennifer Crumbly. He wouldn't have to go through any of this if he would have just done your job as a parent. So he had a chance to, to do it and he didn't. And, and now it's your time. Damning words from that parent there. Trevor all joins us now from Pontiac, Michigan. Trevor, we have a verdict here, but this case is not yet over. Tell us what's next. Well, it's certainly possible that Jennifer Crumbly is going to appeal this verdict, Lindsay, but either way, she's now set for sentencing in April. And before that, her husband James is going to stay in trial. That is scheduled to begin March 5th. And really for the entire country and parents here, this is a landmark moment, given what this jury has decided, that a parent can be held responsible for a child school shooting. Lindsay. Really some uh, wide-reaching implications there. Trevor all joins us from outside the courthouse in Pontiac, Michigan. Trevor, thank you. 
Okay, let's get right to University of Baltimore law professor and ABC News contributor Kim Whaley. Kim, uh, big picture this for us. Uh, what's the message for parents out there? Clearly, the message is that even though legislators across the country and the United States Supreme Court under the Second Amendment aren't taking seriously public safety protections and limits, on gun storage and access, parents had better do that within the confines of their own home. Or if they don't take the steps uh, that the that our government will not do, they could end up behind bars, which might be the fate of this mother. Do you see this verdict leading to new gun safety measures? I'm not sure that would be the case unless there's pressure on parents uh, to shift some of the responsibility to legislators. I think the alternative could be that we're comfortable scapegoating parents and saying we don't want anything in place to actually mandate that these guns have been locked up. I mean, you have to think, what if there had been that law in place? It might be a very different case. She might have complied with the law like we do with seat belts and requiring people to have licenses and not allowing children to get behind the wheel. If that had been the case, maybe she would have taken steps and these children uh, would not uh, be dead in this moment. Um, so it could be that we're just going to shift the blame now to the court systems, the judicial system and parents. The jury at one point had asked a question saying should they infer something that they hadn't heard of uh, the son's testimony. Are you surprised that the son didn't testify in this case? Well, uh, he's in prison for a very long time. I think the uh, there, his lawyers probably did not want to have him see additional trials, uh, additional charges, additional trials. But given that it was his parents whose liberty is at stake, uh, I'm sure that was a very difficult decision. We also know, Lindsay, from his diaries that he uh, articulated attempts to actually talk to his parents about his mental health problems and felt that he was unable to actually reach them. So it might have actually been a calculated decision not to put him on the stand. It could have gone either way and made things even worse uh, for the defense in this case. If the father in this case goes to trial on similar charges next month, what could this verdict then mean for him? Certainly, it's not good news for the father. Uh, you know, it's possible we'll have a different jury, and it's possible that the jury could hold a father to a different standard than mothers. We see this, of course, uh, in domestic cases uh, across the country, that mothers are expected to really know what their, their children are up to and to really be that intermediary. Um, that being said, the, the fact that it was all of these counts, it was a sweeping uh, verdicts of guilty, that would give pause, I think, to the defense team to rejigger their strategy for this dad to try to to you know get a different outcome than the than the mom is facing in this moment. Kim Whaley, so appreciate you tracking this important case with us all week long. Thank you. Thanks, Lindsay. Now to the border tonight and the breaking news there, the House GOP's efforts to impeach DHS Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas over his handling of the border crisis has just failed. Meantime, the House GOP has said a bipartisan border deal just made in the Senate is dead on arrival. President Biden today told Republicans, show the American people you work for them and not someone else. Rachel Scott has the late breaking developments from Washington. Tonight, President Biden with one last push urging Republicans to resist pressure from Donald Trump and pass the landmark bipartisan bill, the most sweeping set of border security measures in decades. It's time for Republicans in the Congress to show a little courage, to show a little spine, to make it clear to the American people that you work for them, not for anyone else. Trump, who wants to run on immigration, has been relentlessly attacking the bill. It's one of the worst one of the dumbest bills I've ever seen. Biden now with this warning, if the bill doesn't pass. Every day between now and November, the American people are going to know that the only reason the border is not secure is Donald Trump and his MAGA Republican friends. Less than an hour later, Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell acknowledging the bill is going nowhere. It looks to me and to most of our members as if we have no real chance here to make a law. McConnell, who supported the compromise, pointing out the irony. Republicans were the ones pushing for border security legislation in the first place. I mean, it's actually our side that wanted to tackle the border issue. We started it. The bill, which was endorsed by the conservative-leaning Border Patrol Union, pumps $20 billion into border security. It includes a trigger mechanism. When migrant apprehensions reach 5,000 a day, the border would automatically shut down. And it makes it harder for migrants to claim asylum. 
all the things Republicans had asked for. Democrats furious. I've never seen anything like it, says Senator Brian Schatz of Hawaii. They literally demanded specific policy, got it, and then killed it. This is what Republican House Speaker Mike Johnson said in November, saying without a border security bill, there would be no new funding for Ukraine. I think we could get bipartisan agreement on both of those matters. But as soon as the bill was released, Johnson declared it dead on arrival. You said a few months ago that you wanted to see a bipartisan agreement on border security and additional aid to Ukraine. Senators said that they did that. They did not send us a border security measure. They didn't. Tonight, anguish from Senator James Langford of Oklahoma, one of the lawmakers who wrote the bill and one of the Senate's most conservative members. We can't keep doing this. We, we've got to actually find ways to be able to stop the chaos that's happening on our southern border. But time never helps. Never. Rachel Scott joins us now from Washington. Rachel, this impeachment resolution just failed. What can you tell us? Yeah, this is quite the embarrassing defeat for House Republicans. They could only afford to lose three Republicans. In the end, four ended up voting against it. Some arguing that impeaching the Homeland Security Secretary over a policy dispute over his handling of the border is not an impeachable offense. Now, the Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, he left the chamber just moments ago. He's vowing to bring this to the floor again. But this is not the way that House Republicans wanted to end this night, Lindsay. And then the vote over Speaker Johnson's standalone Israel aid bill is also over. I understand another defeat for Speaker Johnson there. What happened? Another defeat. Two back-to-back -back defeats for Speaker Johnson tonight on two Republican priorities, things that they have been pushing to get to the floor here all week. And so Speaker Johnson rejecting that uh, bipartisan Senate compromise was pushing for the House to approve a standalone bill to, with support for Israel only. Well, that failed with more than a dozen House Republicans voting against it. Once again, this is embarrassing for him. Uh, this is definitely not the way that he saw this going. And now it's back to the drawing board. The bottom line here there is no congressional approval for additional aid to Israel, additional aid to Ukraine, and nothing on border security right now that has been passed out of either chamber. All right, Rachel Scott, we thank you for your reporting late this evening. And joining us now for more is Republican Representative Tim Burchett of Tennessee. Congressman, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, your colleagues in the House had moved to try to impeach Secretary of Homeland Sec uh, Secretary uh, Alejandro Mayorkas over his handling of the border crisis. As we've reported, that vote has failed. Is this push to impeach the Homeland Secretary uh, over at this point? I'm sorry, ma'am, you, you cut out on me. What did you say? Sure. So we understand that it's failed at this point. I'm, I'm curious if this is over or something that you feel like will be voted on again? I think it'll come back up. You had one flip there at the end, um, I believe, Congressman Murphy, just so he could call it back up. There's a couple, there's one or two in play. I, I think when people go home and listen to their constituents, though, they understand the frustration with with Secretary Mayorkas. I mean, he's told us the border is secure, ma'am. And the border, nobody thinks the border is secure unless you're an anarchist. I don't, there's no no shape, form, or fashion in anything that he's said that has been truthful. So I, I don't really have a problem with with folks changing their mind. I suspect some will. And, um, and when they go home and talk to their constituents. As you know, there are some who say that this focus on impeaching him is is misguided, that uh, if you were to pass this bill that they've been working on, this bipartisan bill in the, the Senate, uh, that it would give people the tools in order to enforce uh, the border. And they're, they're saying that Mayorka simply doesn't have the tools. Well, that's not accurate, ma'am. I've been to the border and they and overwhelmingly, they tell me, I say, Tim, just let us enforce the laws that are already on the books. You know, we the things that the, the things that president has chosen not to enforce is he could, you know, he could end the catch and release. He could reinstate remain in Mexico. Um, he could enter into some of these asylum cooperative agreements. This bill, though, that's coming over from the Senate, 118 billion. It's a Ukraine bill, ma'am. 60 billion dollars for this. Seems like it's a never ending war. In Ukraine, um, I, I just don't buy that. I, I um, five thousand a day uh, is when it sets off the trigger. So if four thousand nine hundred ninety nine come across, that's okay. You're legalizing an illegal activity, and to me, that that that's not sound law. It, Congressman, I guess my question about this bill is why say, look, we won't even accept this. This is dead on arrival. Rather than say, hey, you know what? Let's have a conversation about the potential for compromise that that maybe we would consider. Well, I'm incredibly glad you brought that up, ma'am, because 
we actually sent HR2, the House did, over to the Senate, and um, uh, the Speaker of the Senate will not bring it up. He won't bring it up at all, and it's just sitting over there. It's been over there for months. Why doesn't the president encourage them to do that instead of going down this, this political football road, which we all know is just going to lead to more, more trouble? I mean, we need to demagnetize this country. New York's put $53 million into credit cards for illegals to spend. They're kicking people out of their schools, kicking veterans out of nursing homes to house these folks. Uh, you know, the right is wrong and left is right and up is down. This is this is not the way America should be run. The president can end a lot of these things just with the stroke of a pen, but he chooses not to. The House GOP has passed different border legislation without a single Democratic vote. In the Senate, one of the most conservative members, Ray Langford, worked for months to, to get the first meaningful bipartisan border legislation in years. Today, he said, we can't keep doing this. We've got to find ways to stop the chaos that's happening on our southern border. Since it is a divided government. Are there specific members in the House on the other side of the aisle you would work with in order to try to come up with a compromise? Oh, I work with members every day. My buddy Jared Moskowitz, closest to him, probably as I am to any member on our side of the aisle, and he's probably as far left as I am right, ma'am. I, I don't think that's the problem. I think what you have is the uniparty, and I think where we need to lay the blame on this is not the Democrats or the Republicans, but these national chambers of commerce that you can see their tentacles in this in every angle, and all they want is cheap labor, ma'am, that has no representation. Somebody that if they get hurt, they're not they're afraid to come forward because they know that they could be deported. That's they've been at, uh, at the at the pinnacle of this since this since day one. They're the ones them and the uniparty when they close the door because you know the deal in the Senate. A lot of the uh, the complaints from other senators was they weren't involved in the conversation. It was a closed door meeting. I'd like to know who's behind those doors. And you can say somebody's conservative or they're liberal or what have you. But man, when you close the doors in Washington D.C., the only color they see is green. This, you, you know, they want to call it a swamp. This place is an open sewer, ma'am. Both sides. It needs to be cleaned out. It just flows in and nothing flows out. A swamp is is a cool little ecosystem that God created. This is not a swamp. You mentioned tentacles, in, and many, as you know, have suggested that these really are the tentacles of, of Donald Trump. That, that is the reason why Speaker Johnson is saying, even before he knew what was in the bill, that it was dead on arrival. How much of an impact do you think that, that Donald Trump has, has had in this, calling it a, a stupid bill, the dumbest thing that they could pass? Very little, if any, ma'am, that we had already most of it had leaked out, 5,000 a day. I don't know how much more you need to see than 5,000 a day. What is that, over a million a year? We cannot keep going down this road. We have over 8 million in the last three years since this president took the White House. And man, what's most troubling to me, the number that's most troubling to me is the 100,000 children that nobody's talking about. They could be in, with these cartels, as evil as they are, God knows what horrible life they're in. And both parties need to be, we, we should be ashamed of ourselves that we're not addressing this at, at, at one point. But again, it's closed doors, it's leadership, it's the people that got the money, the K Street lobbyists, the whole bunch. Doesn't have anything to do with America. They don't care as long as they're, as long, it, it, it really is, ma'am. It's, it's portfolios over people. And that's exactly what's going on right here. Portfolios over people. Representative Tim Burchett, we thank you so much for your time. Thank you, ma'am. Now to the unanimous decision against Donald Trump. A federal appeals court ruling he is not immune from criminal prosecution for anything he did while he was president, including his actions on January 6th. The three-judge panel, two appointed by Democrats, one by Republicans, speaking with one voice, saying no former president is above the law for all time thereafter. For what comes next for the former president, here's ABC's Chief Justice Correspondent, Pierre Thomas. Tonight, in a scathing opinion, a federal appeals court rejecting Donald Trump's claims he has complete immunity from prosecution for anything he did as president, including his efforts to overturn the 2020 election. The three-judge panel unanimously ruling, former President Trump has become citizen Trump. Any executive immunity that may have protected him while he served as president no longer protects him against this prosecution. We cannot accept that the office of the presidency places his former occupants above the law for all time thereafter. Trump claims he cannot be tried for trying to overturn the election and his actions leading up to January 6th. The president 
has to have immunity. In court in January, the judge is deeply skeptical, asking if a president could order the assassination of his opponent and get away with it. Trump's lawyer arguing a president can't be charged unless he is first impeached and convicted by Congress. Could a president who ordered SEAL Team 6 to assassinate a political rival who was not impeached, would he be subject to criminal prosecution? If he were impeached and convicted first. And so, so your answer is, is no. Is. Today, the court was blunt. We cannot accept former President Trump's claim that the president has unbounded authority to commit crimes. The judge is also taking aim at the serious nature of the charges Trump faces, writing former President Trump's alleged efforts to remain in power despite losing the 2020 election were, if proven, an unprecedented assault on the structure of our government. Trump is until Monday to appeal to the Supreme Court. If the high court declines the appeal, the judge overseeing the case could set a new trial date soon. But if the Supreme Court decides to consider the matter, all bets are off, Lindsay. There could be lengthy delays. We can imagine, Pierre. Thank you. The National Transportation Safety Board, or NTSB, released a report following the Alaska Airlines incident last month, revealing that four bolts were missing on the panel that blew out mid-flight. Investigators concluded that after the 737 MAX 9 plane was serviced at a Boeing factory in September of 2023, the four bolts were not replaced. Boeing has taken responsibility for the incident. The Federal Aviation Administration is still investigating whether Boeing and its suppliers followed proper safety procedures, and the FAA has barred Boeing from speeding up the production of 737 aircrafts in the meantime. And now to the historic storm battering the West Coast with hurricane force winds, mudslides, and unrelenting rain. Los Angeles receiving a foot of rain and catching many off guard, including this man who had to run out in his underwear to try to rescue his car from rushing water. Water. LAFD with this heroic water rescue of another person and his dog. As officials warn, do not let your guard down. We get more on this ongoing weather threat from meteorologist Rob Marciano in Los Angeles. Tonight, Southern California neighborhoods caked in mud with fears of more landslides as water keeps flowing from that relentless atmospheric river. As the storm continues to impact our city, do not let your guard down. Just look at this car, this house crushed and thrust off its foundation. Mud and rocks sloughing off this hill, and there are hundreds of these slides across L.A. Outside of Santa Barbara, homes hanging on a knife's edge, dozens of people displaced. Huge trees falling onto homes in Pacific Palisades and knocking out power lines in Brentwood. We thought maybe the storm had finished yesterday, but it came out with a vengeance again this morning. In Montecito Heights, this Amazon delivery truck stuck on a hillside, threatening a home below. Rescuers working to get it to solid ground. In pouring rain, first responders and helicopters pulling this man from the rapids to safety. He went in to save his dog, who made it out on its own. Both are okay tonight. Los Angeles officially enduring its wettest two-day period in nearly seven decades. So unusual what people are experiencing there weather-wise. ABC News meteorologist Rob Marciano joins us now from Los Angeles. Rob, tell us more about where you are and, and what's going on behind you. Hey, Lindsay, we're in Studio City that I'm in front of one of the one of the slides that did some damage. It's multiple cars uh, hit and buried this home behind me. Uh, the lower level of it completely blown out, and there have been over 300 landslides across Los Angeles in this rain event. So we're still worried about more. The rain refuses to stop. It's making cleanup efforts today uh, very, very difficult. And flood watches have now been extended into uh, well into the overnight period tonight. So uh, here's where you, here we go. We're transitioning a little bit from uh, a, a warm core to more of a cold core in this AR, which means uh, we'll see more convective activity. We already saw a tornado warning today in San Diego. We've extended the advisories into New Mexico and Arizona and into parts of the Inner Mountain West. And that upper low kind of swings through the area tonight and tomorrow. That will bring with it some thunderstorms, heavy downpours, more in the way of rain, then a break, and then another couple of systems coming through. All in all, another one to two inches, likely around here through Friday, with really it staying wet for the remainder of the week. And, and clearly, Rob, this cleanup is going to be going on for a long time. Is there at least a reprieve coming in the forecast? We should get a break tomorrow afternoon, yes. But then the next system is already dropping down into uh, the northwest, and there's another weaker one behind. Those will be weaker, but they'll have, you know, just enough rain to create a headache, if not a few more uh, problems. The ground is very unstable right now. It's not going to take much for more mud to slide. All right. Rob Marciano for us. Thanks so much, Rob.
U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken met with Egypt's president today to discuss a ceasefire in the ongoing war in the Gaza Strip. Blinken pressed for providing aid to the humanitarian catastrophe in Gaza and pushed for a truce. Also today, Israeli forces say they can confirm that 31 hostages are dead and remain in captivity in Gaza. They either died while being held by Hamas or were killed in the terrorist attack of October 7th. Prince Harry is in Britain just 24 hours after King Charles's cancer diagnosis was revealed. Prince Harry was seen entering Clarence house, his first time seeing the king since the coronation in May. This comes as the UK prime minister says that the king's cancer was caught early. The 75-year-old monarch is said to be in good condition after his diagnosis, receiving outpatient treatment. And there's still much more to get to here on Prime tonight. The CEO of McDonald's is promising affordability for customers, how Big Mac fans and investors are responding. But next in our Prime Focus tonight, the raging debate over Justice Clarence Thomas's role in the case related to Donald Trump in January 6th. Our Devin Dwyer dives into the major test of the Supreme Court's new ethics code. Whenever news breaks, we are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fort, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland, let's go. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today? Escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about. The migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. As the Supreme Court prepares to take on a challenge to Donald Trump's eligibility for the ballot, tonight we're taking a critical look at Ginny Thomas, the wife of Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas, and claims that her role in a campaign to overturn the results of the 2020 election pose a major conflict of interest for the sitting Supreme Court justice. Democrats say as a result, Justice Thomas must recuse himself from the Trump cases. So what comes next? Devin Dwyer has tonight's prime focus. <laughs> As President Trump's supporters rallied on January 6th to overturn results of the 2020 election, the wife of Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas was there. Jenny Thomas was a supporter of Donald Trump's uh, from pretty early on, and she has maintained that support even through today. Virginia Thomas, who goes by Ginny, cheered the crowd on Facebook before violence broke out at the Capitol, writing, God bless each of you standing up. Longtime conservative activist, Thomas had direct access to the Trump White House and helped lead the so called Stop the Steal campaign to keep Trump in power. And then those attempts to overturn the election was what led to the insurrection, which is what led to Trump being kicked off the ballot in Colorado. The decision by Colorado's highest court last year to disqualify Trump from the 2024 ballot under the 14th Amendment is now a historic case before the U.S. Supreme Court. They say we lost, we didn't lose. A key question is whether Trump had engaged in insurrection by attempting to prevent Joe Biden's victory. I would hope that justices who are very reluctant to keep Donald Trump off the ballot would take this language seriously and would realize that they are rendering a decision not just for today, but for the ages. 
But there is also the question of whether justice can be truly blind. I'm afraid Justice Thomas, through his family, has crossed that line, and he should recuse himself so there's no question of bias in his decision. Critics say the activities of Jenny Thomas pose a conflict of interest for her husband. He will be ruling on a case that could determine whether or not the events his wife participated in amounted to an insurrection against the United States of America. Top Democrats have implored Justice Thomas to step aside. Members of the House Judiciary Committee writing him last month, it is unthinkable that you could be impartial, adding Miss Thomas has shown a fervent bias in favor of Mr. Trump, and it's hard to believe that her bias has no impact on you. The question isn't should Ginny Thomas be allowed or not allowed to engage in political advocacy. The question here is, should Clarence Thomas, when Ginny Thomas engages in that political advocacy, be allowed to rule on the legitimacy or illegitimacy of that advocacy? Justice Thomas has not responded to Democrats' demands and has not said whether he'll recuse from the case. But his defenders say their calls are nothing more than a political ploy. I think there are people who would like to see Justice Thomas not deciding this case, and therefore they're going to attack him. Late last year, all nine justices signed the Supreme Court's new ethics code, which says justices should disqualify themselves when impartiality might be reasonably questioned, or when the justice or his spouse has a financial interest in the case. But neither the justices nor their spouses are formally bound by the code, and each justice gets to make recusal decisions on his or her own. It has to do with what is a reasonable appearance of impropriety. The Thomases did not respond to ABC News' request for comment. Justice Thomas has already participated in cases that directly or indirectly involved the 2020 election. In all but one case, he did not recuse. Her activity is her activity, uh, uh, to completely apart from the fact that she is in, has, was not involved in anything uh, illegal on that day at all. Jenny Thomas has said she had no role in planning the January 6th event and that she was disappointed and frustrated that there was violence. And in testimony before the January 6th committee, Thomas insisted she does not discuss politics or cases with her husband as an ironclad rule. Can't we take them at their word? Whether or not Clarence and Jenny Thomas discussed these issues in the privacy of their own personal conversations is not the issue. It's in the public domain that this case can implicate Jenny Thomas in ways that are particularly important to her and thus derivatively important to Justice Thomas. This is the easiest recusal analysis case you could ever imagine. No doubt. No doubt. This is as straightforward as it gets. Jenny Thomas's battle for conservative principles as a political consultant has stretched more than 30 years and distinguishes her from other Supreme Court spouses. America is in a vicious battle for its founding principles. May we all have guns and concealed carry to handle what's coming. I don't think there's any peer, frankly, in terms of the political activism of Jenny Thomas. She stands alone. After the 2020 election, Thomas immediately engaged top Republican officials to fight the results, according to messages reviewed by ABC News. To then White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows, she texted, help this great president stand firm, Mark. You are the leader with him who is standing for America's constitutional governance at the precipice. Around the same time, dozens of emails obtained by congressional investigators show Thomas wrote to Republican legislators in Wisconsin and Arizona, urging them to overturn the will of state voters. It's not sour grapes. It's not enmity. It's not racism. It's the fact that your wife wanted to overturn the election, and we have a lot of cases dealing with that insurrection. Tell us why you are not conflicted. Jenny Thomas has not been charged with any crimes. Her attorney has said she fully cooperated with congressional investigators and is not named in their 845-page report on the Capitol attack. Still, a majority of Americans believe Justice Thomas should sit out cases involving the 2020 election. And nearly as many believe his wife's political activities pose a unique ethical problem. Well, we put on three great justices and you have some other great justices up there and they're not going to take the vote away from the people. Trump counting on his three Supreme Court appointees to take his side and Justice Clarence Thomas, whose wife has boosted Trump's White House bid. This Clarence Thomas scenario related to January 6th or all of the January 6th litigation coming so soon on the heels 
of the court ostensibly adopting a code of conduct will, if nothing else, highlight the need for enforcement mechanisms to make the code meaningful. Many people with strong opinions on that one are thanks to Devin Dwyer. Still much more to get to tonight coming up. Residents in this Florida city are just finding out that their water was tainted by feces months ago. What to do now? But next, the college acceptance letters are coming in, but the letters for financial aid are delayed. We dig into the reasons why by the numbers. at stake. So much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go, you ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is what would you do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching? Watching Saturdays on ABC News Live. What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, yeah. every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. You have another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. The ideal male physique is tall, dark, and handsome. Money can buy you a lot of things. But money can't make you taller, right? We're bringing you behind the scenes of the newest cosmetic surgery. I feel fat. As a man, it's like, man, I wish I was taller. We see men who are taller as the alpha. I went from 5'9". Right now, with shoes, I'm 6'1". Everybody's freaked out by it on the basis of what it's called, leg lengthening. You only live once, so go for it. The Big Business of Getting Tall, now streaming on Hulu. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Traveling with President Biden in Ireland, I'm Karen Travers. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back, everyone. We are closing in on that time of year when many high school students proudly post their college acceptance letters to social media. But the rollout of the Department of Education's now simplified free application for federal student aid, known as FAFSA, has been marred by technical glitches and delays. The headaches are piling up in tonight's By the Numbers. Normally available October 1st, this year saw a 90-day delay of the new FAFSA's soft launch. The application enabling students to qualify for federal loans and grants, such as Pell Grants, did not go live until December 30th, and even then was not fully accessible. As a result, as of January 26th, 57% fewer students have completed the FAFSA compared to the same time last year. That's according to the National College Attainment Network. But now students only need to answer 18 to 50 questions. That's down from 100 or more. The updated form will take some students just 10 minutes to complete. It once took hours for many, eventually allowing more students to access aid. $114 billion is available. That's nothing to sneeze at when the average in-state public tuition is more than $10,000 and more than $23,000 out of state. That's according to the U.S. News and World Report. The three-month delay to get the new FAFSA online could cause some colleges to push back the deadline by which they expect students to commit. Traditionally, that's been May 1st. And we still have much more to get to here on Prime tonight. We are remembering country music great Toby Keith and his songs about cowboys, bars, and America that became anthems for so many. 
And an ABC News exclusive, former Republican presidential candidate Chris Christie speaks out for the first time since leaving the race last month, his frank conversation with George Stephanopoulos. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families Trump. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi, Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes. And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories, start here. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. The steps Meta is taking to identify AI content, a city finds out they had unreported fecal matter in their water for months, and a major recall for two popular car makers. These stories and much more in tonight's Rundown. The Justice Department says First National Bank of Pennsylvania discriminated against black and Latino home buyers in North Carolina for a period of at least four years. The bank, which operates in North Carolina, joins a long list of banks who have been caught redlining. The bank will be required to create a nearly $12 million fund to subsidize mortgage loans for Hispanic and black residents in the Charlotte area as part of a settlement with the DOJ and the state. Users of Facebook and Instagram will soon see labels on artificially generated content. Meta's president of global affairs, Nick Clegg, said on Good Morning America that this is an important first step to label AI content. It's not going to be a perfect solution. There's going to be a lot of this content. Some of it's going to be mixed. It's going to be some of it synthetic, synthetic some non-synthetic. But I hope that this is a big step forward in trying to make sure that people know what they're looking at. A Big Mac may soon cost a little less. McDonald's CEO promising more affordability during an earnings call with analysts yesterday. The restaurant behemoth has faced criticism recently over higher prices at some locations, including an Egg McMuffin costing over $7, a $16 filet of fish and a Big Mac combo meal priced at nearly 18 bucks. Higher prices and slumping global sales have sent McDonald's stocks tumbling. To turn things around, McDonald's is expected to offer more discounts on its mobile app. Former Governor Nikki Haley has requested Secret Service protection. Sources tell ABC News that the Republican presidential candidate has been the subject of multiple swatting incidents at her South Carolina home. Homeland Security Secretary Mayorkas and an advisory council with leaders from both chambers of Congress will begin a threat assessment to determine if the Secret Service should provide protection. Riviera Beach, Florida's mayor has revealed that that city's drinking water supply contained fecal matter last summer. Riviera Beach had assured people that the water was safe then. The mayor, blaming the error on a flawed county health department report, but says the water supply is safe now. After the full investigation is complete, I will share the findings with the residents as well as my colleagues and ask their support in enforcing strict consequences to all involved in this horrible chain of events. 
Honda and General Motors both issuing recalls for some vehicles today. They have recalled various Honda 2020 to 2022 models for faulty airbag sensors that could trigger and then deploy when they're not supposed to. That recall affecting more than 750,000 vehicles and General Motors recalling more than 300,000 pickup trucks to address an issue with their tailgates. National Highway Traffic and Safety Administration saying those tailgates could open while driving. Former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie is talking publicly for the first time since dropping out of the presidential race. In a one-on-one -on -one conversation with George Stephanopoulos, Christie speaks bluntly about Donald Trump, Nikki Haley's chances, and the future of a Republican Party that he says Ronald Reagan wouldn't recognize. So you've had a couple of weeks to reflect on, on, on this run for president. What do you make of it? I mean, I think that the biggest frustration for me is that um, we have so many people in our party who complain about Donald Trump, but none of them are willing to do the hard work that needs to be done to rid our they party and our privately. country. Right. Yeah. Uh, but they, they're unwilling to do any of the hard work that's necessary to rid our party and our country of Donald Trump. But, to, you know, the, to me, George, the entire primary was over the night of the first debate. Why? Because when they ask you, support would you still support him if he was a convicted felon? And six of the eight people raised their hands on that stage. What it says to the largest debate audience we were ever gonna have during the primary is, his conduct is normal. Six of these eight candidates who are running against him say it's okay. So how do you expect voters to think it's not okay? But what does it say about the Republican Party right now that you get booed when you say you wouldn't vote for a convicted felon to be president of the United States. It says that none of the people in leadership have been willing to do the hard work to push back against Donald Trump's lies. Your critics say it took you too long to get there. Well, <laughs> as all of them lag far, far behind me. Nikki Haley's still running in South Carolina. Does she have any chance? I mean, hard for me to say. I, I, it doesn't look like it. I mean, you know, uh, the polling, interestingly, has been pretty accurate. Um, this year. New Hampshire ended pretty much the way we had polled we thought it would end. Which is why you got out? To me, once I became convinced I couldn't beat him in New Hampshire, it was time to get out. Then he had that hot mic moment. She's going to get smoked, and you and I both know it. She's not up to this. What was going on there? I, I, I'll tell you, George, it was a complete mistake, but the way I found out is actually the funniest part of the story. I had my phone on vibrate, but the only person whose uh, ringtone burst through um, when I have it on vibrate, is my son Andrew. And the phone rang and I picked it up and I said, I'm getting ready to go out. He goes, hot mic, hot mic, hot <laughs> mic. He was in the Dominican Republic watching on the live stream. And that's how I found out that the mic was hot. Did you hear from later. Nikki Haley? I did, the next day. Yep. Uh, yeah, it, was, it was a 45 second conversation. She uh, told me I know it's a personal decision to get in a race and it's a tough decision to get out. Um, I heard everything you said last night, including the hot mic. And I said, uh-huh. And she said, well, good luck. And I said, good luck to you. So she didn't ask for an apology, you didn't give one? No, there's no apology warranted. Can you imagine endorsing her a little bit down the road? No, not based on what she said. Um, and I, look, imagine the position I'd be in if I endorsed someone who then turned around and endorsed Donald Trump. Uh, I'm not gonna be put in that spot again, George. I made a decision in 2016, the only time in my political career where I endorsed someone purely for political reasons, even though I had some misgivings. And that's when I endorsed Donald Trump. And, and it was the biggest mistake I made in my political career. And I'm just not going to repeat that mistake for anybody. Republicans, if Donald Trump won, would probably control the Senate. We don't know that they would control the House. We could be back in automatic impeachment land a week into the presidency. And, and look, I think if the, if the Senate had done their job in January of, of 2021 and convicted him, which I believe he'll be convicted by a jury of his peers, for that conduct. If it ever gets to trial. I think it will. And I, my guess is that he will be more likely than not a convicted felon when he gets on the stage at the nominating convention in mid-July in Milwaukee. Okay, you have a book coming out today. What would Reagan do? Would he recognize the Republican Party today? He would not. He would be dumbfounded by it. He would, he would be absolutely perplexed. I think Reagan wouldn't have understood it, but he would have stood up, I think, and that's part of the reason I wrote the book. So who do you vote for in the New Jersey primary in June? Uh, I mean, I, my guess is that there won't be anybody else on the ballot to vote for. 
Other so than Donald Trump by June. No, I would never write myself in. <laughs> um, but, you know, I probably would just skip that part. I mean, look, the, the one thing I could tell you for sure is I don't know what I'm going to do in November, but I'm not voting for Donald Trump under any circumstances. But isn't any vote that's not for Joe Biden, assuming it's the two of them and a handful of third party candidates, isn't any vote that's not for Joe Biden to vote for Donald Trump? Well, we could get into all the technicalities and you well, understand. I, don't know. I think it's pretty clear that it no, is. No, 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 but I... you get it this, you, you know this as well as I do. In my state, in my state, my vote is not going to matter a lick, okay? I don't know who the full field's going to be yet. And, and there might be a no labels candidate um, who I might but look no at. But no labels say, is going to drain more from Joe Biden than Donald Trump, isn't it? I think it depends on who they nominate. I think it depends on who they nominate. If they nominate a strong Republican, um, it might not be the if case. If they asked you? They have not asked me, no. But if they did? Oh, I don't know. There'd be a, be a long conversation between me and Mary Pat, I can guarantee you that. Um, but but you're, you're, you haven't closed the door to it. Well, what I've said in the past is that I'd have to see a path for anybody, not just me, but I think anybody who would accept that would need to see a path to 270, uh, 270 electoral votes. You know, <laughs> this is, if there was ever a time in our lifetime when a third party candidate could make a difference, um, I think it's now. The question, though, is what kind of difference? So, so play, out, play out as a strategist. If, 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 if you're running the campaign now to prevent Donald Trump from becoming president in 2024, what do you do? Replace Joe Biden. I, I just think that Joe Biden is probably the only major Democrat who Donald Trump could beat. And I think that if President... And Donald Trump may be the only Republican who Joe Biden can beat. Exactly right. And... You know, I, I've known Joe Biden for 40 years. I, I like President Biden personally, always have. But, you know, past his sell-by date, it's just time. His argument is he did it once, he did it again, and the economy's improving on my watch. He's a different guy, though, George. Like, Joe Biden could sell it better in 2020 than he's able to in 2024. And that is just a product of age. And this is not me making some clinical diagnosis. I'm making a political diagnosis that the guy isn't as good as he was four years ago. Let's say that Donald Trump does win in November. What does a second term look like? Mayhem. Absolute mayhem. At 16, he was scared. He didn't expect to win. And he was intimidated by the presidency when he first got there. He will not be this time. I think we have to take him at his word. This is going to be the vendetta presidency. This is going to be, I am your retribution. And I think he will use the levers of government to punish the people who he believes have been disloyal to him or to and his it, approach. It, it, bottom line, you think you'll succeed in your mission to make sure Donald Trump is not president again? I don't know, George, but it won't be for lack of trying. I can guarantee you that. Our thanks to George Stephanopoulos and Chris Christie for the conversation. Tributes are pouring in after the death of country singer Toby Keith, who dominated country music with tracks like I Should Have Been a Cowboy. I should have been a cowboy. I should have learned to roll the ride. His lyrics weave life, truth, and humor together, resonating with generations of music listeners. Throughout his career, he earned 20 number one hits. Overnight, Keith's family revealed he died peacefully, surrounded by family after a battle with stomach cancer. He was 62 years old. Olympic gold medalist, two-time WNBA MVP and WNBA champion, Asia Wilson is not only a dominant force on the basketball court, off the court, she's also a vocal advocate for social justice, anti-bullying, education around dyslexia, and the recognition of black women in America. In her new memoir, Dear Black Girls, How to Be True to You, she shares a deeply personal collection of stories from her life, drawing from her own experiences growing up in South Carolina and navigating the world of professional basketball and joining Joining us now is the reigning WNBA champion, Miss Asia Wilson. Thank you so much for coming on. Oh, no, thank you so much for having me. Well, congratulations, first off, on writing the book. And, and I'm curious because you had written an essay back in 2020 with the same name, Dear Black Girls. What made you decide you wanted to expand it to a book? Well, I actually wrote two. I won Dear Black Girls Before the Bubble and then Dear Black Women After the Bubble. Mm -hmm. And it was like I kind of... I had a revolution, like, in the bubble. Like, I had a time to really dial into myself, and then uh -huh. that's when I got so much great traction from it. And I was just like, you know what? We can form this into a bigger story, because I have more to tell. Uh -huh. 
Uh, throughout the book, you, you talk about being a double minority, being black and, and being a woman. I want to quote you here. You say, uh, the truth is we're a double minority. It's like the world is constantly reminding us, you're a girl. Oh, and you're a black girl. Tell me about how this intersectionality of, of gender and race has, has impacted you. I mean, it's impacted my whole way of life, honestly. Mm -hmm. Like, it's like, okay, when someone talking about the basketball, it's just like, okay, yeah, your, your sport's not a sport because you're a woman. But then on top of that, we don't get looked at as much or viewed as much because we are black women and mm. we may not look as the marketable type or people may not want to see us. And it kind of, it, it's hard, but I think the beautiful thing that I found within it is just using my personality, uh, making people understand that I'm human, that I'm real, that I go through things. Like, yes, you see me in a uniform. Yes, you can see the banners, the trophies and the rings. But behind all that, I'm a human. I'm a young black girl that's trying to navigate this world that's not the nicest. And understanding that I can still be successful in my field and love on whoever I want to love on and have fun from there. You know, it's become really kind of like a, a political hot rod in this country as far as like, is America a racist country? Has right. it ever been, right? And and you share a story of a fourth grade sleepover. Share that with our viewers. Yes, so I was in the fourth grade and one of my friends who I thought was really my close friend was having a birthday party and she was just like, yeah, you can come, but you can't stay inside the house. You have to stay outside uh, because my dad doesn't like black people. And that right there struck my core because I was a young black girl in a private school and I just thought everybody was friends. I thought we were all equal and we were all fair. And that's when I kind of realized as I grew up and my parents had to have that conversation with me that, you know, you're not really liked all the time, but mm. you, that doesn't need to change who you are and who you want to become. And I kind of took that story kind of struck my core for a while. And as I got older, it didn't get easier, but I just understood more of like understanding who I am and like how I want people to view me. And I continue to do that to plant seeds for the next generation. There was a part in the book that, that really struck me where you talk about life had never been so good and I had never felt so anxious and so afraid. Everyone always talks about the fear of failure, but the thing I never hear anyone talk about is the fear of success. Yeah. <laughs> Explain what that means for people who have never felt that. Yes, I feel like the fear of failure is always just like, well, we all have, we're human. We always just like, you know, fear of rejection, fear of, uh, fear of failure. And it's just this feeling that we're getting like, ah, oh, I don't want to do it. But then I'm like, when it's actually success, sometimes success can take open up a whole nother level for people to come into. And it's kind of hard to be out there and be vulnerable and allow people into your life to nitpick it and judge you on different things. And that comes with success. You come underneath that spotlight where people have no choice but to pay attention to you. And that's hard. And it's hard to hide from it as well. And I think that's why I was so open with my mental health, because I needed people to know I'm human. What would you like for young readers, perhaps even particular young black girls, to take away from this book? Ooh, I would just tell them just Feel the feelings. I think sometimes we carry a lot on our shoulders. We're swept underneath the rug. We feel like we have to put on a mask every single time we wake up. But some days we don't need to do that and understand that it's okay to feel not okay. It's okay to have days where you're just like, I don't feel like Asia. Mm. I don't want to do this. And know that you're still okay every step of the way and give yourself some grace. <laughs> give yourself some grace. Yes. Words we can all certainly live by. Yes. Asia, thank you so thank much you. for coming on. Really appreciate it. <laughs> want to let our viewers know, dear black girls, how to Be True to You is available to purchase wherever books are sold. And that is our show for this hour. I'm Lizzie Davis. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Up in the next hour, the historic and deadly storm sweeping California. More than 100,000 customers bracing for yet another night without power. And the King's cancer treatment begins. Prince Harry is now in the UK as doctors advise King Charles to postpone all duties. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories, start here. Now, that's a part of the story that you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. You're
how? Your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love that. Me. The ideal male physique is tall, dark, and handsome. Money can buy you a lot of things. Money can't make you taller, right? We're bringing you behind the scenes of the newest cosmetic surgery. I feel as a man, it's like, man, I wish I was taller. We see men who are taller as the alpha. I went from 5'9". Right now, I wish shoes, I'm 6'1". Everybody's freaked out by it on the basis of what it's called, leg lengthening. You only live once, so go for it. The Big Business of Getting Tall, now streaming on Hulu. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> How cute. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We begin tonight with breaking news. The House GOP's effort to impeach DHS Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas over his handling of the border crisis has failed. After the vote, Speaker Mike Johnson told ABC News the House GOP will try again. Meantime, Speaker Johnson has set a landmark bipartisan border deal, the first one in years made to respond to the border crisis, is dead on arrival. President Biden today told Republicans, show the American people you work for them and not someone else. Rachel Scott leads us off tonight from Washington. Tonight, President Biden with one last push, urging Republicans to resist pressure from Donald Trump and pass the landmark bipartisan bill, the most sweeping set of border security measures in decades. It's time for Republicans in the Congress to show a little courage, to show a little spine, to make it clear to the American people that you work for them, not for anyone else. Trump, who wants to run on immigration, has been relentlessly attacking the bill. It's one of the worst, one of the dumbest bills I've ever seen. Biden now with this warning, if the bill doesn't pass. Every day between now and November, the American people are going to know that the only reason the border is not secure is Donald Trump and his MAGA Republican friends. Less than an hour later, Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell acknowledging the bill is going nowhere. It looks to me and to most of our members as if we have no real chance here to make a law. McConnell, who supported the compromise, pointing out the irony. Republicans were the ones pushing for border security legislation in the first place. I mean, it's actually our side that wanted to tackle the border issue. We started it. The bill, which was endorsed by the conservative-leaning Border Patrol Union, pumps $20 billion into border security. It includes a trigger mechanism. When migrant apprehensions reach 5,000 a day, the border would automatically shut down. And it makes it harder for migrants to claim asylum. All things Republicans had asked for. Democrats furious. I've never seen anything like it, says Senator Brian Schatz of Hawaii. They literally demanded specific policy, got it, and then killed it. This is what Republican House Speaker Mike Johnson said in November, saying without a border security bill, there would be no new funding for Ukraine. I think we could get bipartisan agreement on both of those matters. But as soon as the bill was released, Johnson declared it dead on arrival. You said a few months ago that you wanted to see a bipartisan agreement on border security and additional aid to Ukraine. Senators said that they did that. They did not send us a border security measure. They didn't. Tonight, anguish from Senator James Langford of Oklahoma, one of the lawmakers who wrote the bill and one of the Senate's most conservative members. We can't keep doing this. We, we've got to actually find ways to be able to stop the chaos that's happening on our southern border. But time never helps. Never. 
Yeah. Rachel Scott joins us now from inside Capitol Hill. And Rachel, this impeachment resolution just failed. What can you tell us? Yeah, this is nothing short of an embarrassing defeat for House Speaker Mike Johnson. You know, there's a saying here on Capitol Hill, do not go to the floor unless you have the votes. He did not have the votes. Republicans have been pushing to impeach Alejandro Mayorkas, the Homeland Security Secretary, for months now. In the end, four Republicans voting against this, some of them arguing that a policy dispute over border policy is not an impeachable offense. And now Speaker Johnson vowing to bring this to the floor once again, hoping he has the votes on the next time. And the vote over Speaker Johnson's standalone Israel aid bill is also now over. I understand another defeat for Speaker Johnson here. What happened there? Back-to-back -back defeats for Speaker Johnson tonight. 14 Republicans voting against that standalone bill, and Johnson bringing that to the floor in a sense to dare Senate Republicans and Democrats to put that on the floor in the opposing chamber. Well, they couldn't even get it through the House. So just to recap here, you have House Republicans rejecting this border compromise that they once called for. They could not pass standalone measures for additional support to Israel, and of course, that in vote to impeach Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas failing tonight, all because of Republicans opposition, Lindsay. Yeah, not a good night for the speaker. Rachel Scott from Capitol Hill for us. Thanks so much, Rachel. Thanks. Now to a landmark verdict in Michigan. A jury has found Mother Jennifer Crumbly guilty of involuntary manslaughter, the first parent to ever be convicted in connection to a child's deadly school shooting. She now faces sentencing for four counts of involuntary manslaughter, one for each of the four classmates her son shot. ABC's Trevor Alt reports. Tonight in Michigan, that historic verdict. We find the defendant guilty of involuntary manslaughter. Guilty of involuntary manslaughter. Guilty of involuntary manslaughter. Guilty of involuntary manslaughter. Jennifer Crumbly guilty of those four counts of involuntary manslaughter, one for each of the students her son murdered at Oxford High School in 2021. She is the first parent in the U.S. ever held criminally liable for their child's school shooting. The jury, comprised of six men, six women, some parents, some gun owners, deliberating for 11 hours over two days, determining Crumbly failed in her duty as a parent, ignoring the signs of her son's deteriorating mental health and gifting him the gun he used in the shooting. The defense argued it was her husband James's responsibility to secure the weapon, but the jury foreperson saying after the verdict, the thing that really hammered it home is that she was the last adult with the gun. Prosecutor showing this video in court, Crumbly taking her son to the firing range. You're the last adult to have possession of that gun. Correct. The shooter bringing that 9mm handgun to school just three days later. And even that morning, prosecutor said Crumbly had the chance to stop the shooting. Called in for that meeting with her son's counselor, the school concerned about what was written on his math assignment. Crumbly never telling the school to look for a gun. The shooter opening fire hours later. Today, Crumbly sitting motionless, eyes down as the verdict was read, quickly escorted away in handcuffs. The judge thanking the jury. We all know that this is one of the hardest things you've ever done. Prosecutors shaking hands and hugging the families of the victims. And tonight, Craig Schilling, whose son Justin was killed, with this message to Jennifer Crumbly. He wouldn't have to go through any of this if he would have just done your job as a parent. So we had a chance to, to do it, and you didn't. And, and now it's your time. Some damning words from that parent there. Our thanks to Trevor. Now to the unanimous ruling against Donald Trump. A federal appeals court deciding he is not immune from criminal prosecution for anything he did while he was president, including his actions on January 6th. The three-judge panel, two appointed by Democrats, one by Republicans, speaking with one voice saying no former president is above the law for all time thereafter. For what comes next for the former president, here's ABC's Chief Justice Correspondent Pierre Thomas. Tonight, in a scathing opinion, a federal appeals court rejecting Donald Trump's claims he has complete immunity from prosecution for anything he did as president, including his efforts to overturn the 2020 election. The three-judge panel unanimously ruling, former President Trump has become citizen Trump. Any executive immunity that may have protected him while he served as president no longer protects him against this prosecution. We cannot accept that the office of the presidency places its former occupants above the law for all time thereafter. Trump claims he cannot be tried for trying to overturn the election and his actions leading up to January 6th. The president has to have immunity. In court in January, the judge is deeply skeptical, asking if a president could order the assassination of his opponent 
and get away with it. Trump's lawyer arguing a president can't be charged unless he is first impeached and convicted by Congress. Could a president who ordered SEAL Team 6 to assassinate a political rival who was not impeached, would he be subject to criminal prosecution? If he were impeached and convicted first. And so, so your answer is, is no. Is. Today, the court was blunt. We cannot accept former President Trump's claim that the president has unbounded authority to commit crimes. The judge is also taking aim at the serious nature of the charges Trump faces, writing former President Trump's alleged efforts to remain in power despite losing the 2020 election were, if proven, an unprecedented assault on the structure of our government. Our thanks to Pierre for that. A historic storm is battering the West Coast, bringing with it hurricane force winds, mudslides, and unrelenting rain. Our meteorologist Rob Marciano has more now from Los Angeles. Tonight, Southern California neighborhoods caked in mud with fears of more landslides as water keeps flowing from that relentless atmospheric river. As the storm continues to impact our city, do not let your guard down. Just look at this car, this house crushed and thrust off its foundation. Mud and rocks sloughing off this hill, and there are hundreds of these slides across L.A. Outside of Santa Barbara, homes hanging on a knife's edge, dozens of people displaced. Huge trees falling onto homes in Pacific Palisades and knocking out power lines in Brentwood. We thought maybe the storm had finished yesterday, but it came up with a vengeance again this morning. In Montecito Heights, this Amazon delivery truck stuck on a hillside, threatening a home below. Rescuers working to get it to solid ground. In pouring rain, first responders in helicopters pulling this man from the rapids to safety. He went in to save his dog, who made it out on its own. Both are okay tonight. Los Angeles officially enduring its wettest two-day period in nearly seven decades. So unusual what people are experiencing there weather-wise. ABC News meteorologist Rob Marciano joins us now from Los Angeles. Rob, tell us more about where you are and, and what's going on behind you. Hey, Lindsay, we're in Studio City that I'm in front of one of the one of the slides that did some damage. It's multiple cars uh, hit and buried this home behind me. Uh, the lower level of it completely blown out. And there have been over 300 landslides across Los Angeles in this rain event. So we're still worried about more. The rain refuses to stop. It's making cleanup efforts today uh, very, very difficult. And flood watches have now been extended into uh, well into the overnight period tonight. So uh, here's where you, here we go. We're transitioning a little bit from uh, a, a warm core to more of a cold core in this. AR, which means uh, we'll see more convective activity. We already saw a tornado warning today in San Diego. We've extended the advisories into New Mexico and Arizona and into parts of the Intermountain West. And that upper low kind of swings through the area tonight and tomorrow. That will bring with it some thunderstorms, heavy downpours, more in the way of rain, then a break, and then another couple of systems coming through. All in all, another one to two inches, likely around here through Friday, with really it staying wet for the remainder of the week. Lindsay? And, and clearly, Rob, this cleanup is going to be going on for a long time. Is there at least a reprieve coming in the forecast? We should get a break tomorrow afternoon, yes. But then the next system is already dropping down into uh, the northwest, and there's another weaker one behind. Those will be weaker, but they'll have, you know, just enough rain to create a headache, if not a few more uh, problems. The ground is very unstable right now. It's not going to take much for more mud to slide. All right. Rob Marciano for us. Thanks so much, Rob. Now to a very tense scene unfolding in Florida. Bank hostage standoff. The suspect armed with a knife holding it to a woman's neck and a sniper opening fire with the hostages right there. ABC's Victor Kendo is in Florida. Tonight, the terrifying moment. The SWAT team coming face to face with a bank robber who took Listen. two hostages. Listen, just come out here. Let me see your hands and we'll work with you. We'll work with you. Tense negotiations. You can hear the suspect raising his voice. Get Deputies urging him to surrender. I know you're going through a lot, but this isn't going to make what you're going through any easier. Authorities racing to the scene of this Bank of America branch in Fort Myers, escorting people out of the building, deploying a robotic dog. Shortly after 11 a.m., we received a call of a bank robbery in progress with multiple hostages. The sheriff identifying the suspect as 36-year-old Sterling Alavache, saying he claimed to be carrying a bomb and armed with a knife. He started to put one of the hostages in like a, a headlock, and he had the knife to her throat. Suddenly, a sniper opening fire, shooting the suspect dead, freeing the hostages. 
Our thanks to Victor for that. An alarming new report reveals that all the bolts in the door plug that came off that Alaska Airlines flight at 16,000 feet were missing beforehand. The passenger jet had flown nearly 150 flights without them. Here's ABC's Gio Benitez. One month after that terrifying midair blowout, tonight the NTSB says all four bolts meant to hold that door plug in place were missing entirely. In its 19-page preliminary report, the NTSB says the fuselage arrived at Boeing's Renton factory back in August with damaged rivets near the door plug. To fix the issue, the door plug was opened and bolts had to be removed. But the NTSB says evidence shows that when the plug was returned, the bolts were not put back. This photo shared in a text among Boeing employees showing the missing bolts in three visible locations, but apparently going unnoticed by workers. This is going to be a quintessential human factors type of problem and that people fail to do their job. Shockingly, that Alaska Airlines jet making nearly 150 successful flights without those key bolts until that incident in January. In a statement tonight, Boeing CEO saying in part, whatever final conclusions are reached, Boeing is accountable for what happened. We simply must do better for our customers and their passengers. Our thanks to Gio for that. Prince Harry is in Britain just 24 hours after King Charles's cancer diagnosis was revealed. Prince Harry was seen entering Clarence House, his first time seeing the king since the coronation in May. This comes as the UK Prime Minister says that the king's cancer was caught early. The 75-year-old monarch is said to be in good condition after his diagnosis, receiving outpatient treatment. And stunning new satellite imagery shows the devastation of forest fires in central Chile with before and after photos in the city of Vina del Mar. After burning intensely since Friday, the fires have somewhat diminished, but 3,000 homes have burnt to the ground in the area, and at least 123 people have died. The cause of the fires remains under investigation, but officials have suggested they could have been started intentionally. And we still have much more to get to here. Coming up, we sit down with a two-time national figure skating champion, Gracie Gold, whose tell-all memoir is out today. Anxiety, competing in the Olympics, and that self-destructive voice that's in many of our heads. But next, a UNESCO World Heritage Site in northern Japan, and while a coastal city there is closely watching this pot of orcas. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine, Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland, let's go. Yeah! Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Reporting from South Korea, I'm Juhi Cho. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. 
Welcome back, everyone. We're tracking several headlines around the world. First, Ukraine, where Russian forces have significantly intensified their offensive. In the last 24 hours, Russia carried out 126 combat clashes, many near Avdivka. At the same time, Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky announced the creation of a new branch of their armed forces devoted entirely to drones. Zelensky says drones, quote, fundamentally changed the situation on the battlefield in this war with Russia that's now entering its second year. And the former president of Chile, Sebastian Pinera died today in a helicopter crash in the southern part of that country. He was 74 years old. First responders located the crashed helicopter and the other three people on board who survived. Pinera served two terms as president and oversaw quick economic growth and a drop in unemployment in his first term, though his time in office ended with violent protests against inequality. And finally, to a peninsula and World Heritage Site in northern Japan, where fishermen spotted a pod of trapped orcas. Drone footage shows the group of 10 or so orcas trying to stick their heads out of the water in order to breathe. They're impossible to reach because of the thick ice, which has been breaking up and drifting more in recent years due to rising sea temperatures. Our next guest is two-time national figure skating champion Gracie Gold, who is opening up about her reasons for leaving the sport she loved only to then again return to the ice in a tell-all memoir out today. An out-of-shape, worthless loser, the author and Olympic skater lays bare her struggle with mental illness, eating disorders, and the self-destructive voice in her head. And Gracie Gold joins us now in studio. Thank you so much for coming on. No, thanks for having me. So, okay, you were U.S. national champion 2014, 2016. How does that then square with the title, out-of-shape, worthless loser? I mean, so after the 2014 Olympics, um, 2016 nationals went really well. And then I pretty much bombed at the 2016 Worlds in Boston, which kind of set off a series of events that led me into a treatment facility having a mental health crisis. And the book, when you read it, is split into four parts. So part one is Grace Elizabeth, my childhood. Part two, the Gracie Gold, the, yes, Olympian national champion. And then part three is, um, the mental health crisis and you know that voice in your head that tells you you are an out of shape worthless loser um i just happened to name mine and part four is me reconciling all three parts of me and how did you ultimately reconcile that it's been a process you know i wish i just had a single sound bite for you um it's been a process but understanding that that voice in my head does exist but it doesn't have to do harm and that i still have my inner child and that a lot of the you know, Gracie Gold's uh, Ice Princess was not always authentic, but that yeah. she was still a part of me. Um, so far, the reconciling's going well, though. And, and you write, every U.S. figure skating national team member should be handed a single space sheet listing the side effects that they can expect to experience in their ascent. Eating disorders, depression, anxiety, suicidal ideation. Why do you think that this is so prevalent within the world of ice skating? I think figure skating is a really hard sport. I think, I mean, psychologically, right, we're supposed to do the hardest things possible while making them look effortless. And it actually doesn't matter how we think that we did, right, because we're judged by a panel of nine right. strangers and, you know, a technical specialist, there's a referee. Um, and I don't think that they have to be as prevalent as they were in my life. But, you know, I was telling my story. That's kind of the side effect sheet that I wish I was handed. Did you start seeing skating as, as the enemy, so to speak? Yeah, my relationship with skating has been difficult, and strained, tumultuous at times, but I had to realize that it wasn't really the act, right, the sport of skating. It gave me so many gifts and it brought me all around the world. It brought me to the Olympics, but it was really how I coped with all of that stress and that intensity, how I coped poorly with it and some other things in my life. So, you know, I would say it's not it's not really a skating book. Mm -hmm. It's an everything around skating book. And I think there are going to be a lot of different pieces that can resonate with a lot of people. And, and let's just take a little bit of a deeper dive into that, because some people are going to say on its face, oh, this is about ice skating. I don't ice skate. So how would this apply to me? I mean, first off, everyone loves ice skating. <laughs> <laughs> Secondly, um, it's about being an athlete. It's about being a woman. It's about having a difficult relationship with your parents. It's about being a perfectionist. Um, and, you know, it's just about the difficulties in trying to be the best at something and mm -hmm. sometimes just what it's like to fail and to fail hard while millions of people are watching. And, yeah, it's, it's about, it's not a fluffy sports memoir. You know, it's no ice princess or cutting edge kind of story. Um, 
you know, it's just a memoir about growing up and growing up in an unusual environment with difficult people around you and, you know, going to the Olympics. Uh, you don't have to be a skater, I think, to hopefully like the book, but you certainly don't have to be a figure skater or know about the sport to understand the book. Why did you decide to return to the sport? Um, it's a great question, I guess, because I took some time away from it and I missed it. Mm. I missed the parts of skating that I loved, which was the actual act of skating. I think it was some stuff in the culture and the people that were around me at various times that kind of sent me <laughs> off the rails a bit, but that I've always loved to skate. Um, you know, people ask me if you had to do it over again. I definitely would do some things different, mm -hmm. but I think I would always pick skating. Well, we thank you so much for just your, your brutal authenticity and honesty within the pages of this book. Thank you so much for, for sharing your life for everybody to see. And we want to let our viewers know Out of Shape, Worthless Loser is now available wherever books are sold. And still to come, remembering country music icon Toby Keith, we bid farewell to a lauded songwriter who was never afraid to sing about what he believed in. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go, you ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? How cute. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Now to the tributes pouring in for country music star Toby Keith, who landed 20 number one hits singing about cowboys, bars, and America and tracks that became many uh, country anthems. Here's our World News Tonight anchor David Muir. How do you like me now? Country music legend Toby Keith was like larger than now? life. Now that I'm on my way. The 6'4 singer would say he writes about life and doesn't overanalyze things. I want to talk about me, want to talk about I, want to talk about number one on my me, my he was a rodeo hand, worked in the Oklahoma oil fields, played semi-pro football before signing with a record label in his 30s. His first big break, I Should Have Been a Cowboy, in 1993. Singing those songs, oh, I should have been a cowboy. 60 hit singles on the Hot Country Chart, 20 number one hits, 40 million albums sold. His duet with Willie Nelson, Fear for My Horses. We'll raise up our glasses against evil forces singing. Whiskey for my man, beer for my horses. Red Solo Cup, 2011. Red Solo Cup, uh -huh. I fill you up, let's have a party. His lyrics weaving life, truth, and humor. I ain't as good as I once was, and I'm as good once as I ever was. 2002, courtesy of the Red, White, and Blue after 9-11. Brought to you courtesy of the red, white, and blue. Also honoring his father, a disabled veteran. Just 18 months ago, Toby Keith revealing he was battling stomach cancer. Four months ago, at the People's Choice Country Awards, his Don't wife Trisha wiping way. away tears. Try to love him. Stay close to your friend.
Toast each sundown with wine Don't let the old man in In December, three sold-out shows in Las Vegas. And this is what Toby Keith once said about cancer. You got cancer, but cancer don't have you. You just have to keep looking forward and going. But don't let the old man Our thanks to David Muir for that tribute. And that is our show for tonight. I'm Lindsay Davis. ABC News Live is here for you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, Roku, Pluto TV, the ABC News app, and of course on abcnews.com. The news never stops. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Have a great night.